Hello and welcome to this tutorial on the use of the research databases here at Northwestern Oklahoma State University. The first thing you might be wondering is exactly what is a database? Well, a database is similar to our catalog and that is a searchable resource for finding information sources. Databases contain books, magazines, and journals, often with full text. Here at the university, you will typically use the databases to find peer-reviewed articles. But wait, what do I mean by peer-reviewed? Peer review refers to journal articles written by experts in a field whose work is examined and critiqued by other experts before it is published. You might also see the terms scholarly, refereed, or academic. These all mean the same thing. So how do you know if a resource is peer-reviewed? The difference between a peer-reviewed source and a popular source isn't always obvious, but there are some typical hallmarks. Peer-reviewed journals are written by specialists for other specialists. Their purpose is to inform, so their covers are often relatively plain, unlike popular magazines. Their interiors, too, are usually dense with text, again because their purpose is to inform and educate. And of course, every peer-reviewed article should end with a section that looks like this, a bibliography or a list of works cited, because scholarly writers are obligated to cite their sources. By contrast, popular periodicals, typically called magazines, are designed to be flashier because they are a product their publishers want you to buy. Their articles are written for a general readership, and they don't necessarily cite their sources. This doesn't automatically mean the information in a popular source is bad, or that the information in a peer-reviewed source is good, but there is, nonetheless, an essential difference between the two. So when you need peer-reviewed articles, how do you get them? Well, one place you can go is, of course, our library catalog. As we discussed previously, it will give you access not only to our collection of printed books, but also to ebooks, journals, and articles. But it's often a good idea to go to our databases for reasons that will shortly become clear. You can find the link to the databases on the black navigation bar on the library homepage, where you'll see the link labeled Databases. When you click that link, you'll come to the main page for our electronic resources. As we've previously discussed, the A to Z database list is the main feature of this page. It is a drop-down list and can show you a complete listing of our databases. If you don't want to use the drop-down box, you can select the link labeled View More Results. That will take you to a page with a complete listing of the databases. You can see their descriptions by hovering the mouse over their titles. Now let's look again at the main page. You may notice this navigation pane over on the left. This will allow you to browse the databases by subject. If we click the link, we'll come to a new window with all the different subjects listed out. If we select Agriculture, for example, we'll get a page with the databases most relevant to agriculture, such as Environment Complete and a catalog of government publications, and so forth. Now let's come back to the main page. If we scroll down, we can see some other features. This window, for example, has a list of all the databases containing reference works. Reference works, you might remember, are compendia of knowledge, such as dictionaries and encyclopedias. It's a good idea to spend some time looking at our reference databases, as they can give you good overviews of a wide range of subjects. Also note this sidebar to the right. I don't want you to be confused by this. This sidebar lists a set of databases that we have because of a state-funded project that ensures every library in Oklahoma has a basic database collection. Most of these are more appropriate for a public school or public library setting than a university, 
but they still may be worth examining. If you're studying English, for example, you might want to look at the Poetry and Short Story Reference Center. Or if you're in business, you might want to look at the business-specific databases. The database system you're most likely to use, however, is called EBSCOhost. You can find a link to it in the A to Z drop-down list, or you can also find a link right here. EBSCO stands for Elton B. Stevens Company. That's a company that hosts about two-thirds of our databases. Not all of our databases are from EBSCO, but most of them are. When you click this link, you'll come to a window like this. Most of the time, you can ignore almost everything on this page and simply select the link in the upper left that says All EBSCO Host Research Databases. That link will take you to a complete list of all the EBSCOhost databases with their descriptions. You can search multiple databases simultaneously, though it's often a good idea to use them one at a time to take advantage of all of their features. For this example, I'm going to use Academic Search Complete. This is a database with several thousand journals covering a wide range of subjects, so you should make it one of your standard go-to sources but don't rely on it entirely. You need to look at the other databases we have available and learn which ones are appropriate to your research. Once we have the database or databases that we're going to use selected, we can click Continue. That brings us to this screen. You'll notice, first of all, a search bar similar to the one in the catalog. There's also an assortment of search options. It's good to look at these as some databases have specialized options specific to them, but we won't get into those today. Instead, we'll look at how to craft a basic search similar to what we did in the catalog. To do that, we'll search for John Henry again. We type in our terms and then we can click search. So here are our results. You'll notice again that many of the results are about John Henry Newman. We can improve our search by putting quotation marks around the name or eliminating Newman with Boolean operators, but we did that already, so I won't repeat it here. Let's look instead at this left sidebar. It's similar to the one in the catalog, but has some important differences. First, we can limit to full text. That means articles we have in their entirety instead of just the reference information. Second, we can limit to peer-reviewed journals. This is why searching in the databases could be advantageous because it enables us to winnow out popular sources. Third, you can limit by date. Simply adjust these date sliders to limit to older or newer sources depending on what's appropriate to your topic. Now, if we scroll down, we can see some further limiters. I won't go over them all, but I do want to point out the ability to limit by geographical location. For some disciplines, such as nursing, it may be important to limit results to the United States to ensure, for example, that you're getting articles about American medical practices. So let's look again at our results. Another feature I want to point out is this blue navigation bar at the top. There are several options here, but the one I want to focus on is the one labeled subject terms. Unfortunately, the EBSCO databases are not entirely consistent with this label. In some databases, instead of subject terms, you may see another label like thesaurus. In this case, thesaurus doesn't mean a book of synonyms. It means a list of subject terms. It may be called different things in different EBSCO databases, but the subject terms list is always in the same place on the navigation bar. So when we click the link, we come to this page. You'll see the regular search box is at the top, but there's also a second search box underneath it. That's what we can use to search for subject terms. So I'm gonna type in John Henry again, and you'll see that changes the list down below. Once again, the correct term is John Henry Legendary Character. This database, Academic Search Complete, uses the same Library of Congress subject headings that our catalog uses. 
Other databases, however, use other subject terms, which is why it's often a good idea to search the databases individually instead of all together. Once we've found the term we want, we can click the checkbox next to it and then click Add. This will automatically populate the main search box as you see here. Now, when we run this search, we get only 23 results, all of which should be relevant. Now we'll limit to peer-reviewed sources to assure that all of our results are scholarly. Once we do that, you can see that we have 15 sources. Let's take a look at a couple of these sources. This first one says that it has a PDF of the full text available, but this other one says that we can order it from another library. That means the full text isn't available in the database. So let's click on that link. That brings up an interlibrary loan form, similar to the form you can get from our library catalog. You can see that the item details are already filled out for you, so you should only need to fill in your contact information. And again, be sure to use your university email account, not a personal one. Now let's take a look at what happens when we select a full text. This gives us access to a PDF file of the article. Downloading the article to your own computer is generally a good strategy to make it easier to keep track of the articles that you're using. I want to highlight this sidebar over on the right. Specifically, this little piece of paper will bring up automatically generated citations. As with the citations generated by our catalog, these citations are not necessarily correct, so be sure to proofread them if you want to use them in your papers. And as with the catalog, it's possible to export these citations to reference management software. Now let's go back to the results list and take a look at a few more features. Now I want to show you just a few more features. Let's see what happens when we select search history. This will show you all the searches we've conducted so far. So if you don't like the results you're getting and you need to backtrack, you can do so with the search history link. You can even take your previous searches that you've conducted and modify them in a few different ways. Now, I've also mentioned before that you can create an account with EBSCO, so let's sign in and we'll see a few different options that that gives us. You will, of course, have to sign in with a username and password. Once you've done that, you can select articles to save to your folder by clicking on these folder icons. Now let's go up and look at our folder. And you can see all the articles that we've saved. Since we're logged into a personal account, these articles will still be available later when we log back in. By logging into your account, you can potentially uh, do your research on multiple computers and still be able to get to all the sources that you've discovered. Now there are many more features that I could show you, but this should be enough to get you started so that you can explore the system on your own. Thank you for joining me today and happy researching. And remember, if you're having any difficulty finding your sources, please ask us at the library for help.